Um, so welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the third lecture in the Wolfson Center lecture series. My name is Julia Sinderovic and I'm a senior lecturer here at the Wolfson Center. Uh, and for those of you who are new to the Wolfson Center, it's a multidisciplinary research center focusing on youth mental health at Cardiff University and in partnership with Swansea University and other partners. Um, so uh, this is a public lecture and as you can probably see it being recorded. You can also find previous lectures on the Wolfson Center YouTube channel. The session today will be one hour, so we'll aim to finish around three o'clock UK time. Uh, questions, discussion are very much encouraged. We want to hear from you. So there's a Q&A box that you should be able to see on your screens. So it's really helpful if you type the questions in there so we can keep track of them. Um, and if you want to hear about future Wolfson and events, you can sign up to the mailing list on, on the Wolfson Center website. Uh, the next lecture series uh, will take place in about a month on the 6th of July, uh, and it will, it will be delivered by Professor Catherine Shelton on the experience of being in care and child mental health. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, speaker today, uh, Dr. Danielle Mitchelton. Uh, so Daniel is a senior lecturer in clinical psychology at the University of Sussex. He is also a consulting clinical psychologist at Sangha, which is a nonprofit organization based in India, and I think really a global leader in community-based mental health promotions. And working with Sangha, Daniel has the development of the Premium for Adolescence Intervention, or PRIDE for short, which we'll hear about today. Um, and from my point of view, reading about PRIDE, what really stood out to me is how systematic and, and thoughtful the intervention development process was from understanding the existing system of school mental health services to understanding the problems that young people experience to matching practices from the evidence base to these problems and then evaluating and adapting the pr program, which is why we were so excited that Daniel agreed to speak about, about this work. So I'm delighted to, to welcome Daniel. Thank you for coming to speak with us today. The floor is yours. Uh, I think you can go ahead and share your screen. And I'll... Okay, is that showing up all right? Yeah, we can see full screen. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, many thanks, Yulia, uh, for the invitation to talk today. I'm very pleased to um, be here with you virtually. Um, so as, as Yulia was saying, I'm going to uh, focus this talk on some research I've been involved with over the last six years now, uh, and this is the PRIDE program in India, uh, and that stands for Premium for Adolescents. Um, and it's very much a, a team effort. So um, here we have just, uh, well, uh, relative, I'm, I'm not sure that it's even the majority of the team. I mean, over six years, we've had lots of people uh, join and move on from the program. Um, but I just want to acknowledge uh, colleagues at, at Sangath NGO and particularly uh, Patty Gonsalves, who is uh, one of my PhD students, who's been very involved on uh, in, in developing uh, the digital side of the Pride program, and also uh, Kanaka Malik, who is a clinical psychologist who has um, been sort of instrumental in supervising uh, the, uh, some of the, the counselors we've been working with in India. Um, and also, I want to acknowledge uh, Professor Vikram Patel, who is now at Harvard Medical School. And uh, this program originally started as uh, his Welcome Principal Research Fellowship when he was based in the UK at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And since he's moved to the States, it's it sort of been reconfigured in a number of different ways, but um, th this, uh, this is work that sort of he instigated and uh, it follows on from his own um, premium uh, fellowship. And I'll say a bit more about the premium program and how that influenced what we did in, in Pride. Um, so in terms of what I'm going to cover today, I, I just want to give a bit of background uh, to, to the work. I don't want to dwell too much on, on that, but I, I think it's helpful to give a bit of context in terms of the um, uh, sort of what it is we were trying to do with, with Pride. Um, and I'll describe a bit about the program itself. Um, and what I've tried to do is um, sort of focus on 
I've got four lessons from the work. Now, when I first started putting together the presentation, I had it as six lessons, and then that was just too much to fit in. So uh, it's very much kind of edited, edited highlights. Um, so, um, but by no means is this sort of an exhaustive uh, trawl through six years of work, but, but hopefully it, um, I'm going to be able to pick out some interesting uh, points that will um, be relevant to work that um, colleagues uh, at Cardiff and elsewhere may, may be involved with at the moment. Um, and I'll also say a little bit about kind of further directions um, for where kind of we're going, uh, building on from Pride and, and where uh, sort of where we have some new collaborations that are developing that that will also kind of build on what we've what we've started um, with the Pride program. OK, so. Um, this may not come as a surprise to to uh, people uh, listening to this uh, talk, but 90% um, of the world's population um, aged under 25 years live in low and middle income countries. So um, when we're thinking about addressing the uh, global burden of youth mental health problems, um, by, by definition, we have to think about, you know, uh, focusing on, on low and middle income countries just because they make up uh, they, they constitute such a large proportion of the world's youth population. Um, now, this slide is showing median age um, of, of countries kind of around the world. And the kind of the reds, the darker oranges, those are sort of older populations. And then the sort of uh, pale, sort of beige, pale yellow is kind of younger populations. And kind of at a glance, you can see that the, the, uh, the oldest populations in the world are those in sort of Western Western Europe, uh, North America, Australia, and then you can see in sort of uh, South America, uh, Africa, you know, much of Asia, we have kind of younger, younger populations. Um, now, in terms of kind of why uh, youth mental health problems are so important to, to, uh, to address um, from more of a kind of uh, general kind of health, health perspective, um, uh, I mean, they are very much uh, amongst the leading uh, causes of um, kind of social disability uh, amongst young people kind of worldwide. So um, kind of collectively, uh, mental health conditions account for the, the largest share of um, uh, social disability um, caused by kind of any health condition. And you can see from this slide that anxiety disorders are particularly significant uh, amongst kind of younger adolescents, and then depressive disorders uh, become increasingly important as we as we move up into kind of middle adolescence and, and, and older adolescents. Now, um, you know, when it comes to addressing uh, mental health problems globally, um, we one often hears a reference to kind of the treat, treatment gap. Um, now, the treatment gap is discussed particularly in low and middle income countries, but it exists kind of throughout the world, including in high income countries, because um, I think it's right to say that even in you know, even in the UK, it's only about I think 25 percent of young people with a diagnosable mental health condition who actually uh, receive a kind of specialist mental health care. So the treatment gap is not confined to low or middle income countries. And by treatment gap, we mean the difference between the number of people who might actually need uh, mental health care and those who actually receive it. Um, now, as well as a treatment gap, there's also a quality gap, and that refers to substandard care received by people with mental health problems. So it's one thing to get access to uh, in mental health services, it's, it's another thing to actually receive what, what would be considered an evidence-based intervention. Um, and there's also uh, a prevention gap, and, and by that I mean poor coverage of interventions that target risk factors for mental health problems. So how can we address uh, the treatment gap, prevention gap, um, and uh, potentially the quality gap as well? Well, task sharing is one solution that has gained uh, a great deal of traction in low and middle income countries. So by task sharing, I mean training and supervise non-specialists to undertake roles that conventionally would have been provided um, would have been delivered by by specialists so 
you know, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and so on. Um, now, of course, uh, human resources are, are limited, uh, particularly in low middle income countries. So the idea is that one can overcome some of these human resource, um, some of these human resource constraints by uh, sort of train, training and supervising um, others in, in uh, to, to carry out some of the roles that might have otherwise been done by professionals. So some examples are community health workers, um, but also there's examples of lay people and peers um, being trained to undertake kind of mental health uh, intervention delivery roles. Um, and there's now quite a substantial amount of evidence showing that uh, task sharing interventions can be effective in improving mental health problems uh, for a variety of different conditions and a variety of different settings. Um, but they are not without challenges. Um, for example, uh, there are studies showing um, sort of lack of confidence and stress that can be experienced by people in task sharing roles, particularly when they, they lack uh, adequate supervision. There can be skepticism encountered from healthcare professionals and also a lack of incentives to sustain involvement. And that's a particular challenge uh, when you're moving on from kind of research studies, so where a, a research trial, for example, has specific funding and there's ways of reimbursing um, you know, non-specialist providers, when that trial ends, um, ensuring some kind of sustainability and continuity of of the of the intervention is is a real is a real challenge. Now, technology uh, has also been um, sort of highlighted uh, kind of all, all over the world really as offering uh, the potential to increase access to to mental health care um, and there's much talk of kind of closing the treatment gap by narrowing the digital divide so technology has been um, kind of it, it could be used in a number of different ways so one way is to um, uh, help with the training and Kind of supervision of of lay health workers so digitizing training providing remote supervision so you don't physically need a specialist supervisor uh, kind of co-located with um with kind of non-specialist providers uh, there's also applications that involve uh, the actual delivery of the intervention so telecounseling uh this sort of technology being used for diagnosis there's more kind of self-directed interventions that involve apps, smartphones, kind of uh, the internet, etc. Um, now, there's a lot of enthusiasm, sure, you'll appreciate around uh, kind of digital interventions being provided for young people, given that young people tend to be early adopters of technology. Um, and there's an opportunity for early intervention and delivering kind of youth friendly interventions uh, in ways that kind of conventional mental health services may may struggle to do um and i mean there's a there's it's a little bit of the wild west kind of the the realm of um kind of digital mental health care lots of things are out there um one tends to find quite a lot of kind of feasibility and acceptability studies but effectiveness data are still kind of relatively rare and especially so in lower middle income countries um now, one of the reasons why it, it's sort of this lack of this relative lack of research in low income countries is important is is because, uh, you know, and this is not a sort of a particularly original point, but th this idea of kind of ensuring cultural um, cultural relevance of interventions and making sure that interventions are culturally appropriate. So there's a few, well, there's sort of three things that I've I've got on this slide as as being kind of important to this. Uh, sort of debate about what you, why culture is important and what might need to be adapted to ensure that interventions are culturally appropriate. So, so one side of this is about ecological validity. Um, so the fact that the populations that have been the focus of, of most research um, just, are, you know, it doesn't allow for generalizability of interventions elsewhere. And um, you know, it has been shown in some studies that if you simply take an intervention off the shelf and deliver it to uh, a different population, uh, one finds sort of indications of low acceptability, such as kind of high dropout. 
Um, there's also evidence from systematic reviews showing that interventions that have been targeted, adapted and targeted to specific cultural groups are actually more effective. Um, and this can be done at more the surface level. So in terms of kind of language adaptations, but also at, at sort of a deeper level when content adaptations might be made. Um, and there's also an ethical argument and, and that relates to sort of potential adverse effects arising from interventions that might ignore or minimize cultural issues. So I, I'm not gonna say um, uh, very much all about sort of the, the methods that one might go about using for cultural adaptation or more broadly for contextual adaptation. And certainly colleagues at, at Cardiff who are um, kind of, well, real leaders in, in this area of contextual adaptation of interventions. Um, so there's a number of frameworks that exist, um, but broadly speaking, uh, one would follow kind of three phases. And, and that's, that's what we've done in our work in India. So an initial phase is about um, assessing kind of the needs of potential target populations, engaging with wider stakeholders, uh, understanding their priorities and the resources that are available to provide interventions. Um, and then building on that, identifying kind of relevant strategies from, uh, from the literature and developing a theory of how um, sort of uh, a putative intervention would uh, achieve desired outcomes. And then one moves on to actual piloting and assessing acceptability, feasibility, and then making refinements before um, evaluation in, in trials. So this sort of phased approach is um, something that is, is fairly mainstream now in kind of global mental health research. Um, and, but, but it's sort of easy to forget that that wasn't always the case. And if one goes back um, you know, ten, even 10 years, 15 years, there was some scepticism that kind of psychological treatments that, um, you know, were, were in wide use in high income countries, that, that they might have kind of any relevance in, in low middle income countries, or that they were far too complicated for non specialists to deliver. So, um, Vikram Patel, um, was was PI on, on a welcome funded premium program. And the aim of premium was to kind of establish uh, an, an almost like a proof of concept for how one could go about adapting and implementing um, evidence-based psychological treatments for common mental health problems. Um, and the focus of premium was on kind of adult mental health. And two interventions were developed and trialed one was for adults with depression, one was for adults with alcohol problems. Um, so in Pride, we have sort of um, carried forward this kind of, this sort of developmental method with, with some important tweaks, um, and we have applied it to the area of, of adolescent mental health. Okay, so um, the work that we, have done in Pride, um, obviously has been focused in India, and we've worked particularly in, um, in New Delhi and Goa. Um, now, it, it's sort of worth saying though about India um, as, as, a, as a focus for this work. I mean, India has the world's largest population of young people and about one in five adolescents alive in the world today live in India. So it's a vast, a vast population of, of young people. So if one can develop um, interventions that have you know, wide applicability in India, one's actually reaching potentially a, a really large um, segment of the global adolescent population. Um, and within India, the, the youth mental health treatment gap, so those are kind of young people who might require a mental health intervention but don't actually get it, it's been estimated at sort of greater than 90%. Um, now, as I was saying, we, we worked in New Delhi and Goa. Um, for anyone who's been to either of these places, you can imagine they are quite different settings. So the idea was to um, try to develop uh, interventions that were, were broadly applicable. So even in uh, quite, you know, even in very diverse settings in India, and India is an enormously diverse um, country, of course, uh, that, that, that one could have an approach that, that could be scalable and could be applicable on, on a large scale. 
Um, these are just some images showing uh, uh, schools in Delhi and our councillors at work in Delhi. Um, so we worked in government run schools in, in Delhi. Um, so these cater to low income communities. Um, space was a real issue in these schools. So in the uh, picture in the top right, you see this kind of curtain, which was an improvised uh, solution to create a, a private space for counselling within um, within the library. So you see a couple of counsellors there in the middle, uh, actually sort of uh, set up in, in one of the libraries. Um, and um, you can see in sort of this uh, at the bottom, you see sort of that there are actually a couple of counsellors that we had in each in each session um, for a certain period of time. Um, and we were working in all boys schools in, in Delhi and, and some all girls schools and our female counsellors um, sort of uh, had some initial issues around some sort of harassment in those schools. So we, we introduced sort of, uh, sort of co-counsellors co to, um, to sort of uh, help, help with that, uh, some of those difficulties that they were facing. Um, so these pictures are from uh, from Goa, a slightly more kind of bucolic uh, setting. Um, and these pictures are some of showing some of our sort of our initial focus groups where we developed uh, or sort of tried to understand more about what young people preferred in terms of um, uh, support and so on. And you can see at the bottom, it's called a counselling drop box. This was something that we developed to um, enable referrals directly from young people and to enable sort of a discrete method for them to sort of uh, put themselves forward for counselling so they could write on a slip of paper what their problem was and their name and their class. Um, and you can see in the bottom right, here's an example of, of something. And this says uh, of, of a problem that uh, one of the students identified and it says, I have a problem. Some boys in our class teasing with boy's name and telling bad words. So if one was going to fit this into a diagnostic framework, it it wouldn't be entirely straightforward. And um, as I'll come on to say um, a bit more about the, 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 the problem solving approach that was kind of central to um, at least one step of our sort of intervention model, um, that was sort of uh, selected partly to deal with the fact that um, uh, young people were in fact primarily presenting with what we might call kind of psychosocial problems as opposed to kind of clear kind of symptomatic uh, difficulties that would fit within say anxiety or depression. Okay, so um, ultimately what we were trying to do in Pride was develop um, uh, sort of a, a transdiagnostic intervention framework. And we were interested in targeting a range of common adolescent mental health problems. So it wasn't specifically about anxiety, depression, uh, or, or conduct difficulties, but sort of addressing a variety of emotional and behavioral symptoms and associated psychosocial difficulties. Um, and you know, one of the reasons for taking this broad focus was, that, was so that one could you know, help a larger number of young people, but also, as I was alluding to, um, you know, problems do not necessarily present in India or, or even to some extent in the UK and sort of other settings as discrete, um, you know, discrete diagnosable uh, clusters, um, uh, you know, and that's particularly the case for kind of younger adolescents before problems become more, more persistent. So we were interested in something that would be broadly applicable, could be delivered um, as a form of early intervention. Um, and then we were interested in evaluating effectiveness in reducing prioritized psychosocial problems and symptom severity. And we were also interested in investigating digital strategies to support um, scaling up. So the work carried out over um, six years or maybe six and a half years. Um, originally, it was a five-year program, but because of COVID, there were uh, there were some extensions. Um, there are a number of linked formative and pilot studies in community and school settings. Uh, we've done four RCTs and we've had two PhD students who've been embedded in the program as well. Um, to say a little bit about kind of the theoretical foundations of PRIDE. Uh, we took a transdiagnostic perspective, as I was saying, um, and, and uh, thinking about kind of risk and protective factors that would be common across a, a variety of, um, kind of mental health, uh, mental health problems. 
um, and we, and um, our theory of change was based on stress coping principles, the idea that um, sort of negative emotional responses uh, result from an imbalance between uh, kind of perceived stressors in the environment and one's own resources, perceived resources to uh, manage those challenges. So it was about equipping young people with coping skills to act on stressors that were potentially modifiable and also equipping them with skills to manage uh, say their own emotional reactions where um, addressing a stressor directly may not be possible or may not be appropriate for other reasons. Um, the uh, interventions were sort of assembled from kind of cognitive behavioral practice elements that had you know, a solid evidence base uh, globally. And there was an emphasis on, on parsimony. So it was about trying to achieve the maximum coverage in terms of the mental health problems that could be um, addressed, but from a minimum number of cognitive behavioral elements. So instead of kind of, you know, th throwing everything at it and, you know, having multi-component interventions with, uh, you know, many, many different um, kind of elements all kind of bung together, which one quite often sees in CBT protocols, it was about including just the minimum number of elements um, that would conceivably achieve uh, an effect um, across kind of broad psychopathology. Um, and we assembled these elements within the step care model, the idea being that um, one offers a broadly applicable intervention at step one and problem solving was the focus of step one. Um, and then those who didn't respond would get a, an extended intervention um, that was offered in the sort of guise of modular CBT with modules matched according to um, young people's kind of problem types. Um, so it was about increasing specificity um, over uh, sort of over the course of treatment. Um, so starting general and then getting more, more specific. Um, Okay, so this slide is sort of illustrating the step care architecture. And at the base of the pyramid, we have what we sort of called step zero as a shorthand. So step zero was delivered sort of universally uh, to classrooms. Um, and this was about increasing awareness of um, mental health problems and trying to generate referrals, basically. Um, uh, moving up from that, step one was offered to uh, young people who met um, certain inclusion criteria uh, based on sort of problem severity and um, impairment. Um, and we had a, a sort of a first line problem solving intervention delivered by counsellors. But in parallel with that, we uh, developed a sort of digital app based version of, of problem solving. And then for non responders, we offered tailored modular CPT. And over time, well, as one moves up the pyramid, there's kind of increasing resources being allocated. So more time in the delivery and more training and supervision being offered to the providers of those interventions. Um, now I was saying I was trying to distill uh, lessons pride uh, down to sort of four, four areas. So, um, without getting into all the nitty gritty of kind of, you know, more than, I don't know, 15 or so papers that, that we publish now, uh, I just want to sort of try to pull together a, through, uh, a few kind of threads from, from the, the different pieces of work that, that we've done. So um, thinking about the base of the pyramid, um, one of the lessons I think that has been important is about uh, how beneficial it can be to put a personal face on demand generation. Um, it's a slightly awkward phrasing. I haven't come up with sort of a, a nicer formulation. If anyone has any ideas, you can let me know. But the idea behind this is that um, by, um, by using, by, by making counselors visible in schools and by giving opportunities for counselors to engage with um, young people uh, on a kind of universal basis before referrals have been made, seem to be really quite effective at um, removing potential concerns about seeking help and um, kind of demystifying the process of, of help seeking 
um, to, to a certain extent. Um, now, you know, mental health stigma exists all over the world, but particularly high in, in India. Um, and um, there is a, a sort of general, sort of the, the, the general evidence base suggests that demand side interventions are interventions just trying to increase um, in, increase help seeking. They're more likely to work well if they're targeted directly at young people rather than focusing on parents and adult gatekeepers. So that was the approach that we ended up taking in developing this kind of step zero sensitization intervention. So uh, counselors went directly to students, they went to the classrooms, they presented a video that explained what kind of counseling entailed, they explained what problem solving was about, um, they had an opportunity for a Q&A and then they accepted referrals directly from young people immediately following these sessions. And they also had these drop boxes set up, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, now, this slide is showing a sort of um, a handout that was given to, um, to teachers because as well as accepting self-referrals, we did also accept kind of referrals directly from, from teachers. We didn't engage directly with parents, um, one of the reasons being that um, in the schools we were working in, parents were very often kind of daily wage laborers and it wasn't, it, it just isn't possible for them to take time away from work and come into schools and meet with counselors or participate in, in interventions. Um, so um, it, referrals were basically coming about through self-referrals from young people themselves and, and from teachers. So this is, this is a handout that was developed to, um, uh, to sort of guide uh, teachers through the process of referring. Um, and we also developed some flyers that um, were available in schools. So we didn't actively hand these out to parents, but they were available in schools if parents did, did come into school for, for whatever reason. Um, so in terms of um, evaluating whether or not step zero made a difference, we, we carried out a step wedge cluster RCT that was embedded within um, our evaluation of the step one problem solving intervention. So we looked at different ways of getting referrals into the trial of the problem solving intervention. And we had we sort of designed a, a trial that could evaluate the those referral pathways themselves. Um, so um, basically we compared the classroom sensitization intervention with uh, sort of um, a situation where um, referrals were only generated through engagement with teachers and through posters and flyers that were available in schools. Um, and what we found is that out of 835 referrals, um, uh, just over 20% of students in the uh, classes that received the, the, um, the step zero intervention, just over 20% of those students referred themselves or rather were referred um, and less than 2% of students in the control classes were referred. Um, and uh, roughly kind of 90% of all referrals were generated through self-referrals. So, uh, teachers made a very small contribution to referrals in, in both arms of, of the study, um, but it was slightly higher in the, um, in the control arm. So basically the uh, kind of going to classrooms and um, having opportunity, presenting opportunities to interact with the counselors really made a big difference to the willingness of students to put themselves forward for counseling. Because if you think of it as over 20% of the entire Kind of a class um, class putting themselves forward. I mean that's a pretty high, uh, pretty high proportion. Um, but what we found is that only about a third of these referrals actually met our case criteria. So although we were getting a large volume of referrals, it didn't necessarily mean that a large proportion of them were were eligible for for sort of further treatment. So this does beg the question of kind of why they were referring themselves and whether or not symptom thresholds are um, you know, the ideal way of uh, determining eligibility for interventions in, in this kind of context. Um, but moving on uh, now to sort of some other, some other lessons to pull out. So, um, and I've sort of 
link these two lessons together. So one being that the brief problem solving intervention delivered by lay counselors um, can have sustained effects even after 12 months. Um, however, there seem to be some diminishing effect of step care being offered after step one. Okay, so step one was evaluated in a, um, uh, a two on randomized controlled trial. Basically, we compared uh, problem solving delivered by counselors with just handouts that um, kind of taught, taught problem solving and there was no contact with the counselor. Um, and um, we evaluated outcomes on um, a sort of ideographic measure of problems. So by ideographic, I mean problems that were named and prioritized by young people themselves rather than them kind of ticking a checklist of, of symptoms. Um, and we measured symptoms as well. Um, we measured uh, them at six weeks and 12 weeks. Um, and we also did a post hoc follow up. So we modify, we, we got a trial modification to do a, a one year follow up. Um, and kind of separately from the step one trial, we also looked at um, sort of in a cohort study, we looked at what the effects were of offering step two after step one. Um, and we tested three iterations of step two. One was a two provider model where you had kind of a lay counsel providing step one and then a more experienced psychologist doing step two. We also looked at a single provider model and a remotely delivered version that was delivered during the pandemic. Um, just to sort of show the, uh, the handouts that I'm talking about. So these were used in both arms of the trial, but in the counselor led um, version of step one, uh, sort of they got the handouts plus they had sessions, brief sessions with a counselor. And we use the acronym POD, where P is about identifying a problem, uh, O is about um, selecting, uh, sort of generating options, and then selecting one that you're going to actually put into practice, and that's the D for do it. Um, the um, uh, so, sort of POD steps were illustrated through some comics, uh, comic books that were handed out, where sort of there were stories showing how uh, sort of adolescents um, kind of applied the pod steps to their own problems and they were split sort of there were three different installments of the comics uh, dealing with kind of primarily with the P, the O and the D um, and there were also some sort of written exercises for students to work through um, and this slide is showing the sort of um, effects on the uh, sort of two main outcomes that we were interested in um, so on the YTP, that's the youth top problems, that's the ideographic problem measure. So we found a significant difference between the two arms at all three time points on the strengths and difficulties questionnaire that is a standardized measure of um, mental health problems. Uh, we found differences at six and 12 weeks, but they weren't significant. But then by one year, there was a significant difference between the two, um, between the two conditions. Um, and I also want to say a little something about some of the process indicators in the trial. So the intervention, the, the sort of counselor delivered version of, of problem solving, it was delivered in just five sessions. Um, and they each session lasted for um, just over sort of 20 minutes on average. And the duration of treatment was about, about three weeks. So it was about two sessions a week. Um, but 20 minute sessions, maximum of five sessions. Um, so really very brief because the full course of treatment would, the maximum anyone would get would be about kind of 100 minutes, 120 minutes over about, over about three weeks. So much less than sort of what we would see conventionally in, um, in sort of so evidence-based kind of psychological treatments. Um, about 80% of participants um, kind of completed the intervention. Um, and what was interesting is that in terms of reasons why uh, some participants didn't complete, the most common reason they gave was that, well, their problems had just got better kind of very quickly. So they felt they didn't need to attend kind of four or five sessions. Um, now, another sort of point to note is that um, the control intervention, which was kind of just problem solving handouts by themselves, um, that was actually valued by um, participants in that arm. They, they didn't necessarily see themselves as getting short changed by getting um, uh, just the booklets. Um, 
and qualitative interviews that we did with participants in, in both arms of the trial, um, but, but particularly in the control arm, suggested that um, kind of participants didn't, they actually saw their interactions with researchers when they, when they were doing um, sort of outcome assessments. They saw those interactions as a form of counseling. So they referred to having already seen a counselor, even though ostensibly they were in a self-directed problem solving intervention. Um, so that's quite important when one comes to kind of interpreting the um, the uh, sort of outcomes of the trial and also thinking about what the active ingredients might be in, in treatment. Uh, now thinking a bit about step two, um, so the, the, that hasn't been um, evaluated in a trial. Um, there was a plan to do an RCT of step two, but sort of the pandemic rather scuppered that. But we have looked at it in a fairly large uh, cohort study. So 80 adolescents were offered um, step one, um, and we found that at the end of step one, um, around about half of those who received step one um, had not remitted from their symptoms. So we reassessed them on uh, the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, um, and they were still kind of above eligibility thresholds for um, th that we'd uh, set at the beginning. Um, but of those cases that were non-remitted, only a third of them actually opted in for further treatment. Um, and so what this seems to be suggesting is that kind of adolescents were, um, you know, even though symptom measures were suggested, they still had ongoing problems. From their point of view, many of them felt that, no, actually their main problem had resolved um, and they were quite happy to stop there. Um, and there were also some indications that kind of adolescents were not very keen to carry on for much longer, having received four or five sessions of step one, they weren't very keen on getting some additional sessions and they weren't very keen on the idea of shifting from one therapist to another therapist. So the idea of moving from a less experienced person doing step one to a more experienced person doing step two, that wasn't terribly popular. Um, and there was a suggestion as well that sort of having more opportunity to discuss whether or not they might want something else and what they might want was preferred as opposed to there being some sort of uh, binary choice based on um, uh, sort of uh, some arbitrary uh, severity threshold. So I just wanna show a video now that lasts for three minutes. And this is a video made with uh, participants in the step one trial. And um, hopefully it gives some flavor of kind of what the benefits might've been for some of the participants and how um, kind of step one participants construed the, the potential kind of advantages of or, or what they liked about, about the problem solving approach. Um, so let me just change how I sh share my screen. So let me stop sharing briefly, share screen. Da, 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 da. Okay. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Counseling. Every time I come to school, I ask if you have any 
कोई भी हमारी जो समस्या होती है उसे सॉल्व करने के लिए पहले कई अन्य तरीके जितने तरीके हो सके सॉल्व करने वो तरीके निकालो उन सब तरीकों में से जो सबसे बेहतर तरीका हो उस पर मतलब काम करना चाहिए हमें जान देना चाहिए कि अगर हम मान लो बातों से समझाएं तो बच्चों को भूख में लगता है उतना ना समझ पाए तो अगर भूख के माध्यम से समझाते हैं स्टोरी के माध्यम से तो बच्चों को रिलाइज होता है कि हाँ कि अगर इनके साथ प्रॉब्लम है तो मेरे साथ भी हो सकती है तो बच्चों कहीं ना कहीं समस्या चुनने में और समझने में भी हेल्प होती है Just off the side of the road, sat a grand. Sorry, hopefully we're back on now. My computer went a bit funny there. Okay, so just some takeaways from this. So brief counselor delivered problem solving does seem to be effective both in the short and long term. Um, problem solving is contextually and developmentally appropriate for a population of disadvantaged stress adolescents who prioritize rapid problem resolution. But the non-specific aspects of counseling were very positively received. And so it's important, I think, not to overlook these aspects when you know, we debate which sort of technical solution might be most appropriate for a, given, for a given context. And sometimes those aspects are, I think, underdeveloped in sort of training and supervision of, um, of psychological interventions. Um, and when we think about step care, well, problem solving seems to fit logically as the first step. So problem solving is giving a framework for adolescents to put into practice coping skills they may already have. Um, and then where those coping strategies are not effective or they may be underdeveloped in some way, step two is an opportunity to learn new additional coping skills and to practice those in a more kind of concerted way. Um, but there is a potential mismatch in between kind of stepping up criteria based on symptoms and um, felt need and um, kind of shared decision making may be one way of addressing this potential mismatch. Um, but shared decision making isn't something that has traditionally been addressed in step care protocols in low and middle income countries. Um, and so it does raise the question of kind of what 
additional training might be needed for um, non-specialist providers to uh, sort of deal with some of these nuances uh, in terms of what you know what further support might be needed and how to personalize interventions without sort of you know very structured algorithms um, and just the final um, kind of uh, area I, I, I want to sort of touch on before finishing is um, lesson about kind of the, the digital side of, of what we did in Pride. And um, there is a bit of a gap between kind of enthusiasm for digital solutions and the potential they may have, and then the actual kind of reality of how, um, how they can reach into particularly disadvantaged populations and how they might actually be used in practice. So we developed um, a sort of a game-based problem-solving app called Pod Adventures. And the rationale for doing that was, you know, it, we found, as I mentioned before, it was only about a third of, ref of referred young people who actually met kind of case thresholds, but there was still become a large demand for some kind of help. Um, and so even lay counsellors were not able to provide help to everyone who wanted it. So the thinking was a, di a digital intervention could be offered uh, that required even less counsellor input. Um, and we developed this app um, originally to be offered in schools, but on um, kind of tablets or smartphones that we provided, but delivered offline. So it was preloaded on tablets. Um, so that's how we originally developed it. Um, but then we sort of tried it out in an online format during the pandemic while schools were closed. Um, so I just have a few kind of screenshots showing aspects of the game. Um, basically, there was a, a sort of a virtual worlds where the, the kind of user controlled sort of characters and interacted with um, peers and with sort of other other characters. Um, and there were sort of scenarios that were sort of played out that uh, required the user to sort of um, select certain coping strategies and put them into practice. And there were also some sort of mini games that were used uh, that were a way for sort of um, users to sort of practice certain coping skills to do with visualization and relaxation skills. Um, uh, yeah. And there was also a guide character to help um, sort of users through the game and we made provision for counsellors to kind of introduce the game in in classrooms so you can see on the slide in the bottom right there you can see adolescents in classrooms in Goa um, they had sort of headphones so that they could kind of work through the game privately um, and kind of what we ended up finding in sort of a cohort study that was done before the pandemic is that there was very high engagement, um, a very high satisfaction, and it was very efficient for the counsellors. So you could have one counsellor at the front of a class, but you could have, you know, 10 or more adolescents in the room um, using the intervention. So you can see how sort of it put much less demand on counsellors' time. Um, but there was still a counsellor on hand to address any kind of questions that, that, that came up. Um, so it, it looked very promising in, in this cohort study. Um, now we had to make some quite significant um, uh, changes for delivery during the pandemic. So basically we switched it all on to sort of online. So adolescents who were doing home homeschooling, who were not in schools, they could download the app and use it on their own device or more commonly use it on um, a sort of a device that belonged to one of their family members. Um, and we ended up sensitizing about uh, 1500 students, but we ended up with 11 participants enrolled in a randomized controlled trial. So, uh, you know, irrespective of any kind of stop go criteria we, we might have developed, I mean, straight away, 11 out of 1575 suggests there's some real feasibility issues there. Um, so, what this I think is showing is that um, you know digital interventions are not all created equally. A lot depends on how they are actually made available. So there's a big difference between providing actual devices and making them available offline or making them usable offline in school settings versus requiring adolescents to download interventions in their own time. Um, 
So, you know, in terms of using these interventions outside of schools, there were issues about them having time to use it. There are issues about privacy, being able to use it pri privately in the family home. Um, um, and also some concerns about sort of, you know, what was going to happen with the information that they shared, um, et cetera. So I think what this is suggesting is that, you know, potentially hybrid approaches might be might be worth thinking about. So certain kind of contact points at school as a way of achieving onboarding and initial engagement, and then potentially uh, sort of on online, um, you know, delivering interventions online, you know, beyond that, or continuing delivery actually in school, actually in school settings, which seem to work quite well for us. Um, so I realized that was a sort of um, whiz through various lessons learned. I mean, just to conclude by saying something about future directions, um, I mean, Pride formally concludes in September of, of this year, after about six and a half years of, of work. We're in the midst of doing a randomized control trial where we look at two different methods for training non-specialists in the problem solving intervention. Um, we're also looking at ways of um, sort of securing additional funding to do further evaluation of pod adventures, um, kind of now that schools are back running in person, we think there's some merit in evaluating it on a larger scale in, in its original kind of uh, format. And also step two, we haven't had a chance to do an RCT out of step two. Um, we're also interested in applying tar sharing in UK settings. And we have some funding from the NIHR to do some work where um, sort of community partners are involved in uh, sort of co-developing and delivering low intensity psychological interventions uh, to, to young people. Um, and there's also interest in extending uh, pride to other kind of elmic settings. So uh, we're working with colleagues in Kenya um, to uh, sort of pilot a version of pride for HIV affected youth. Um, and my last slide is just a few discussion points, really, in case we still have time for that. Um, I mean, obviously, we are dealing with um, you know, there's huge diversity in, in India uh, and, and, you know, of course, other settings. So there is a question about whether we are able to engage with so-called hard to reach or, or seldom heard youth. So who is actually coming forward in schools and what about young people who aren't actually engaged in in uh, secondary education. Um, as I sort of alluded to before, we, we haven't really engaged with families um, or sort of systems outside of schools. So it's worth thinking about whether or not step care is just, you know, could be one component of a, of a sort of um, kind of a you know, multi-component uh, intervention working at kind of multiple, multiple levels. Um, and also, um, you know, when one's thinking about wider applications of pride to, to other contexts, you know, which, which aspects of pride may be particularly um, relevant? You know, is it about the sort of uh, the packaging in terms of a very lean, very brief interventions? Is it about problem solving? Is there something about sort of the, the ways that we've supervised and trained non-specialists? Is it a combination of those things that may have wider applicability? Um, and just to say, for those who are interested in more information, um, this paper here is sort of uh, gives a, a nice overview of the development of the program. And I have a full bibliography on these slides, which um, uh, I'm sure that can be that can be shared. So thanks very much. That is everything I have. So I, for, for everybody who needs to leave on the hour, thank you very much for joining. Um, and I've posted into the chat link to our newsletter and information about the next talk. Um, since Daniel has a few more minutes, for those who also have a few more minutes, um, we have a couple of questions um, for you, Daniel, one in the chat and one in the Q&A. Um, so the, the question in Q&A from Abby Rowe, I don't know if you can see it. Um, it's, it's asking about the training and qualifications for the counselors. Um, in, in, in Pride. Mm -hmm. So I don't see the message actually. Uh, I can't see that in the chat, but oh. yeah, I can, I can certainly, yeah. So the question is just how were they trained and supervised? Is that, is yeah, that with, with regards to the counselor delivered problem solving interventions, what yeah. training and qualifications did the counselors have? Yeah. So they, 
they didn't have any any qualifications in terms of formal qualifications in you know uh, in in um sort of mental health practice i mean they weren't you know they weren't social workers they weren't psychotherapists they weren't psychologists i mean they had they tended to have an undergraduate degree but without any kind of practical practical experience um and the training itself was um uh sort of week of um sort of intensive classroom teaching with role plays and sort of um you know lectures to get them familiar with the manual and then they uh had the opportunity to sort of you know practice they had a number of practice cases that they worked with um supervision was provided in a in a peer group format with other counselors and that was facilitated by a psychologist so they had opportunities to uh listen back to recordings of sessions done by peers and to rate those on a number of quality criteria and to get you know, feedback along the way from from, um, from a psychologist um, so they didn't receive kind of individual one-to-one -one special supervision it was this peer group peer group format um, so um it was a relatively brief yeah, relatively brief training. And we have now turned it into a digital format that can be done entirely online. So there's um, kind of PowerPoints that are automated with a voiceover and there are kind of video role plays that they can engage with. And the idea is that it takes, a, it's meant to take about kind of, uh, I don't know, between 20 and 40 hours of, of, of time to kind of work through that material over about, over about four weeks um and as as i mentioned we're, we're doing a trial at the moment looking to see how effective that might be at improving competencies versus uh so, so a purely self-directed digital format or a format that's facilitated by a by a coach who sort of links with them um remotely Thanks so much, Daniel. Like everything else about Pride, this is so well thought through. Um, so we have a few more questions, if that's okay with you. So we should we say we give it five more minutes? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's fine with me. Great. Um, so since 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 you cannot see the Q and A box, maybe I'll just I'll just read it out for the sake of time. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question from Shaini Geffen, and apologies if I mispronounce your name. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Two questions, time permitting. What now that evidence has been established, will this be implemented in schools? Do you have the local district support? Um, I guess that's the question. Yeah. Uh, do we have local district support in India for this? Is yeah? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, so so what what's happening after the trial? I mean, it's a good it's a good question. It, it has been a little bit. Oh, it's been complicated for a number of reasons. Um, and the issues in Goa and in Delhi are a bit different. Um, and um, one of, I mean, of course, having had the pandemic now, and you know, India has some of the longest school closures of anywhere in the world. Um, you know, that that in itself caused a major kind of disruption in in the kind of continuity of delivery. Um, and um, at least in Delhi. The local department for education, uh, you know, it changes subject to results of local elections, and so so that so it has been difficult to kind of get get continuity. But what we have uh, encountered is kind of there are a number of organisations. Um, it typically led more through sort of and instigated more by NGOs rather than school districts, let's say, where they are interested in applying it in their own you know it in in the course of their existing kind of work with with young people not necessarily in schools though so um it's been a bit ad hoc so far in terms of kind of other other groups who are interested in kind of take, taking it up um but i mean it's certainly something that we're going to be looking at more closely in in the remaining kind of few months about how you know basically putting the the resources out there engaging with you know a variety of um kind of stakeholders and um you know we all of the sangath makes all of its materials kind of free of cost it publishes everything 
um, sort of uh, in, in full and makes everything available at, at, at no cost. So, um, so certainly in terms of getting the materials out there, you know, there's no question of, of kind of restricting access to them or anything like that. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and we have a kind of related question uh, or um, a, set of, a set of questions um, asking about whether you think uptake would be greater in private schools and mm -hmm. whether you anticipate any differences in engagement across socioeconomic levels. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if uptake would be specifically better in, in private schools or not, but I mean, certainly engagement at the school, put it, there, there may be some implementation may be eased in some ways through, uh, you know, at, at a private school level where there may be more autonomy at the school level in terms of what can be implemented and so on. So I could see implementation being eased to some to some extent. Um, in terms of uptake amongst students, I'm not sure. I mean, in these government government run schools, I mean, you know, over 20% of all the students in sensitized classes refer themselves. So uh, uptake wasn't, you know, wasn't particularly low, I would say. Demand was not low in, in, in these schools. Yeah. Thank you. And I guess in India, there are also those low cost private schools that actually target the, the very poor, right? Um, so we have, we have a few, few more thanks, uh, lots of uh, thanks actually, and lots of um, um, congratulations on the excellent presentation. Um, do you want to take a few more questions or do you want to wrap up? Yeah, sure, absolutely fine with me. It's weird, some of the things are showing up in my chat, but not all of them, It's um, so I'm not quite sure. So there is a chat, yeah. and then there is like the usual Zoom chat, and then there is a Q&A. You will see uh, or, you. next to the participants number. Right, this is why, okay. So uh, got it. We have, we have questions in both. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Got it. Format. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. I can. Uh, yeah. Sure. Okay. Sorry. So what? Uh, what should I deal with? So do 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 do. Okay. So there's something about further information about adolescents that didn't remit. Were they more likely to have higher scores at baseline? That's in the chat, not in the Q and A. <laughs> Yeah. yeah are you seeing that one or not yes yes okay fine um i mean we didn't so no, none of the studies um were sort of large enough to kind of test for moderators of effect with any kind of degree of reliability um in the trial we did do some exploratory analyses and we didn't see any clear effects of symptom symptom severity um so i can't speak directly to that issue except to say although they may have shown up as being non-remitted because you know their sdq score had dropped below you know a certain cut point that's not to say that they themselves um they still might have felt that actually their problems did get better and they were quite you know they were reasonably satisfied with the outcome okay now whether they were just saying that because of social desirability bias or or not i mean that's not the question but you know if we take it at face value i think it's the it, it's probably the case that for you know, a, a reasonable portion of young people irrespective of what the sdq might have shown they felt that their main problem or problems had resolved and they'd got something useful out of the intervention and as far as they were concerned, they had got what they, you know, more or less what they what they needed. So it was kind of what I was trying to allude to before is, you know, I want need to interpret the, the, the non remission with, you know, with some degree of, of caution. And, um, you know, this is an issue across the whole field of, uh, you know, me mental health research and trials, you know, what are meaningful, what are meaningful outcomes, you know, as, as trialists, we often put outcomes in there because well they've been using lots of other trials so it helps with comparability but they may not be the outcomes that are especially meaningful and then it becomes even more complicated when we're thinking about cross-cultural relevance of, of outcome measures so um I'm, I'm not in any way trying to suggest that you know 
it was universally effective. But 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 I but I think the the, the non remitted cases, it, it it's a bit you know we have to be cautious in interpreting those. Thanks, Daniel. I think that's so important as we think about population level approaches. Uh, so I think we just have two questions left in the Q&A. Uh, I mean, you've already addressed a little bit the training of the counselors and you have ongoing research on that. I don't know if, if there's anything else you want to say on that. And then whether well, the digital app is running and I can answer that one because I have downloaded and gone through it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so in testing of regulatory, I mean, we didn't, um, I mean, we didn't, well, in, in the trial, we're comparing, um, you know, the digital training program that someone goes through kind of at their own pace with the same training materials that are hosted online, where a coach checks in with them on a weekly basis to kind of keep, you know, keep them motivated and to keep them engaged. So that trial is ongoing um, and we're still recruiting participants for that for that trial. Um, and so that should hopefully tell us whether or not, you know, a, a coach is helpful and also whether or not just purely kind of pre post whether or not if you're in, if you're engaged in a digital training program in whatever format whether you know what impact it makes to kind of your, your competencies right. Um, so that will answer those questions, um, I mean intensity and rigor of training isn't something we've specifically looked at i mean everyone got the same you know in the trial that we did the step one trial everyone got the same classroom based training we didn't systematically alter it and if they didn't turn up for the training for whatever reason you know we didn't let them loose on on cases right um and you know we had pretty good that, like quality ratings in our trials so there was you know good adherence to the protocol and you know the quality of sessions was was good um i mean that's not to say that it was when we did some of our i don't know pilot studies that it was consistently you know consistently high there was some variation but but we weren't able to you know that wasn't down to the training intensity being different per se it's just you know some people seem to be better at it than others right or some people respond better to supervision than others um, yeah. and there was something about uh, is the intervention through the digital app still running um i mean I, I think it is they're still downloadable i think it was i think it was on the google play store i think yeah um yeah yeah so i think it's still available for anyone who wants it i mean we're not evaluating it you know formally now there's not like a trial that's ongoing um but but it is i think downloadable and um we um something i've done in the last few months is i've had some uh, sort of undergrad students who've done done a piece of work looking at how the app um in its kind of the incarnation that's been used in india how that is viewed by um, young people in the UK, so secondary school students and university students. Um, not that we expect it to just, you know, be directly applicable, but just to kind of, um, you know, understand what what aspects of it might be, you know, viewed positively, and then what are, you know, potentially more the surface level things that might need to change. Um, so we we have done some work, kind of looking at how it could be used in in other in other settings or adapted in other settings. But so far, it's only been evaluated in in India. Um, and as I say, the, the the online only version, we we ended up with a very small a very small sample in that study. Thank you so much, Daniel. I, I wish we we had. Uh many more hours to pick your brain about the many facets of this study. Um, but I know that we are over time. So I just want to thank you once again for your time and, and looking forward to following this work as it, as it evolves. Uh, thank you for challenging and informing our thinking. And thank you to everybody who joined online and to everybody who asked questions. Um, and like I said, uh, if you're interested in uh, future lectures, um, there is a link to um, the newsletter for Wilson Center and the next lecture coming up on the 6th of July. Thank you very much. <laughs>